Hi, thanks for joining us for today's message from Calvary in Lake Havasu. We are in 1 Corinthians with a message to a messed up church. Today's focus is on the great reversal. If you'd like to grab your Bible, we will be looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 18 through 31. To follow along with the life notes, you can download them at calvaryaz.com forward slash life notes. Now here is Pastor Robert Smith. Go ahead and have a seat and open up your Bible to the book of 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 1. Um, if you don't know where 1 Corinthians is, it's on page 1,131 in the, the Bibles that are in the chairs around you. Uh, or if you find the New Testament, you'll find the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Then it'll go Acts, Romans, and 1 Corinthians. I'm giving you some instructions because we're going to be here a bit. So if you don't know how to find it, you're going to get some practice because we're going to be in 1 Corinthians for about the next five months or so as we do a deep dive on this book. And uh, I hear some of you celebrating. For those of you lamenting, I can't hear you, but that's okay. I, I love uh, the deep dives in books. And I know some of you are like, hey, I just want to visit and kind of go to another place. I like some variety. And so we try and give a little bit of both. But what's so great is when we do these deep dives, you really get to know a book of the Bible. You really get to know what's in it and, and, and kind of the, the characteristics and nature of it. You also get to know the people that it was written to. So 1 Corinthians is the first letter to the church in Corinth. They were so messed up, they got two. Um, we're just going to look at the first book, uh, maybe save the second one for another year. But but as you look at this, see, we use the tagline, a message to a messed up church, because when you look at the church in Corinth, they had some issues. Um, and, and Paul basically is, is taking uh, this chance to correspond with them, to correct them on some things in a pastoral way, to say, hey, you guys are in the wrong. Here's how you need to correct. Here's some, some things that we're going to see as they go over it. So last week we saw there was division in the church over which of their pastors or leaders they would follow. And uh, none of us were would ever have favorite pastors, so that doesn't apply to us at all. So uh, we saw last week, though, the, the need for unity, not just in you know, what leadership you like, but in how we interact with each other, that unity is so important. Um, there's going to be other issues that come up, issues like uh, the church members suing each other and being very divisive and petty with that. They're going to see issues of, of intense sexual immorality, even incest happening within the church members. And, and some of these uh, are not PG rated. So if you're reading to your kids, uh, proofread beforehand. But there's, there's other things. There's confusion over marriage and singleness. There's confusion over the, the roles of men and women, both within the church and in, in everyday life. There's confusion over spiritual gifts and how those should be played out, how they should interact in church leadership. There's confusion over even if there's a hope of a spiritual resurrection from the dead if they were to follow Jesus. There's all these things that, that he's seeking to, to clarify and correct them on. And as you read through that, you really get a sense that if, if you're a part of a church, your goal shouldn't be to be like the church in Corinth, but our goal should be to be unlike them. Hey, we don't want to be like the church in Corinth. That should be our goal. But when you look at that, you also see that some of these issues are not new issues. And some of these issues we see still coming up in our day today, which means as we look at this over the next few months, they're gonna be incredibly relevant for how uh, Paul brings the truth of the gospel to correct our thinking in some of these ways. But before he gets there, he has to say, hey, on what foundation do we correct our thinking? On what ideas, on what foundation do we say this is the ultimate truth? And so before he starts really getting into some of these issues, he has to lay a, a framework and foundation. And what he's going to do is he's going to show that, that God's message, God's truth, uh, the gospel is the thing that we need in all of these areas of our life to teach and base everything off of. So he's going to do some foundation work and basically use this as a platform for the next uh, 12 to 14 chapters or so uh, to really say, hey, this is what you need to understand and continue to go back to. So with that in mind, let's take a look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1. We're going to start down in verse 18 and see what that has to say for us today. It says this, it says, for the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to those of us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it's written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. So where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom. It pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, 
a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. He says, for consider your calling, brother. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in this world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. So Paul's wanting to establish a foundation again for how we understand the, the, the truth that we come back to as, as he addresses some of these core beliefs and misunderstandings over the next several chapters. And he starts with an interesting idea, and he starts by talking about the foolish message. He says that the, the message of the cross, the message really of all Christianity is folly, it's foolishness, it's crazy talk to those who don't believe. And some of you are in this place and, and you've been a Christian long enough that maybe you've forgotten that from the outside looking and it really does look foolish. Or maybe some of you are sitting in this place and you're not yet a committed follower of Jesus and you're like, yeah, some of this stuff is a little, a little crazy looking. And, and when we step back from it, there's a lot of things that, that even Paul, as he's talking about, there's things that, that make this look foolish. See, when you're looking from the outside in at the message of Christianity, you see things like a lack of preferred evidences. See, he talks about how, how the Jew want, is wanting signs. They want uh, these, these indicators that Jesus was the Messiah. They, they wanted to match things up. The Greeks wanted wisdom and, and to prove that Jesus was the wisest person. And, and they wanted a specific set of evidences in order to believe. And the same is true today. People want to say, hey, okay, I, I, want to, I want to hear you out on this Jesus stuff, but show me the historical evidence of Jesus. Show me the literary evidence that the Bible hasn't changed. Show me the scientific evidence that God created the world instead of my scientific view of things. And so they, they have this, this hang-up of, of evidences and a specific preferred evidence. Or maybe they look at it and they just see a lack of usefulness. They go, yeah, my life's fine on my own. I don't really need God. I don't really need to add one more thing. Or maybe they look at Christianity and there's a hang up because the message of Christ doesn't give them affirmation for their choices. See, at the, at the core of it, Christianity requires us saying, I'm not right and there's someone above me who is. And it requires us surrendering all of ourself, all of our life, all of our ideas to the, to the refinement and correction of a savior. And it requires us being willing to be wrong. And we don't like that. Even those of us who do believe in Jesus sometimes hang up on that idea of I don't want to surrender my ideas to God and have him change him or tell me that I'm wrong. But see, we, we start here with this foolish message because we have to understand that for those that are looking at this, it looks crazy. And, and for the people that are in our life, we're gonna have friends and family and neighbors and coworkers and people that we're interacting with that think the beliefs that we have are crazy. They're gonna look at our life and look at our worldview and go, I don't understand this. I don't understand this concept of, of living your life on an old book. I don't understand this idea of surrendering your plans and your desires to a supreme being. I don't understand any of that. And the reality is that we should expect that. Because we're, we're told right here that it's, it's folly, it's foolishness to people on the outside looking in. And so we should expect that, that people look at us as, as people who belong to a cult and are crazy. And the truth is that with each passing year as our society moves away from values that mimic Christianity to embracing new values, we look more and more unique. And that's a good thing because that gives us a unique ability to be the, the salt and light of God in dark and broken places. It allows us to stand out and bring hope and truth into their life. But see, we start here because that's how it might look to us. And if we're not careful, we might continue to think some of the ideas of God are foolish in, in contrast to our own. But we start here because it doesn't stay there. 
See, Paul says that the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but he says, but to those who are being saved, it is the power of God. He goes on in this whole passage to explain that, that the message of cross brings power and wisdom into our life. So let's talk about God's powerful message as we look at this, because when we step into a life-changing relationship with Jesus, when we say that Jesus is our savior, there's a transformation that happens, and this message goes from one that seems a little foolish or crazy to one that brings intense power into our life. So where do we see this power of God's message? Well, first we see it in the message itself. See, when you look at it, he's saying the message of the cross, which really is the message of Christ, which is all of scripture. All of scripture points to Jesus. Even the Old Testament, you look at it, you might think, how does this have anything to do with Jesus? It's all pointing to our need for a savior. It's all pointing to the fact that all of the Old Testament religion didn't solve their issues, they needed a savior. The New Testament just continually points to Jesus, either the things that he did or how we follow him more faithfully. And in Jesus' life itself, we see the power of God in some pretty big ways. First, in in the life that he lived and the miracles he performed, we see the power of God. He continually showed his dominion and power over the creation, this thing that that we think is unchangeable. He would calm storms, he walked on water, he healed people's illnesses, he brought people back from the dead. Continually showing that he wasn't just some teacher or religious leader, but he was one who had dominion and authority even over the laws of physics. He showed his power. But Jesus showed his power by taking on the punishment for sin that we deserve. See, at the the end of this passage, Paul kind of does a drive-by on that. He says, uh, in Christ who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification, he says, and redemption. Redemption is when when a, a penalty is paid for someone else. It's Jesus stepping in and saying, there's a punishment for sin. There's a penalty due, and I'm paying that for you. We get it more clearly explained in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24. In there, Peter explains, he says, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree so that we might die to sin and live for righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. See, I don't, I don't know what your story looks like, but I can look back at my life. I can look at some, some dumb decisions that I made. I can look at some, some painful words that I spoke to others. I can look at some, some moments that I wish I could reel back in from reality. And the idea of me paying the penalty for all of the sins of my life seems overwhelming because I can't. But Jesus can, and he did. Jesus took the punishment for my sin, for your sin, for anyone who professes him as savior. That penalty is paid. That shows an immense amount of power in that moment that he did for us. But then we see the ultimate power of Christ shown in his resurrection. Because see, it's not just that he went to a cross, took on our punishment and was buried and that's the end of the story. No, scripture says that he rose three days later. And that's so amazing and so pivotal because it's what separates Christianity from literally everything else. It's what helps us understand the, the power of God, but helps us understand how relevant and helpful this is to our life. Because the resurrection is what allows us to, to pin our hope and, and our, our longing for a, a good news to come into our life. It's what helps us understand that Christianity is different than any other religion. Because every other religious leader who has lived on this earth died and was buried and stayed there, except for Jesus. See, when you look through history, you see these religious leaders, you see uh, people like Buddha, Muhammad, Confucius, even modern day, like Ron Hubbard, Joseph Smith, they died and were buried and stay there. They have tombs and graves that you can go visit and pay homage to. You look at other major significant people throughout history, Alexander the Great, Julius Caesar, Nero, philosophers like Plato, Aristotle, Socrates, even, even religious leaders, you look at the apostles, you look at uh, Christian leaders like Martin Luther, you look at Catholic popes, all these people have one thing in common, they died, were buried, and stayed there. But Jesus is different. There's no tomb that you can go visit and, and know that his body's on the other side. There's no grave that you can go on a pilgrimage and say, hey, here's where Jesus is buried. In fact, there's one that you can go and walk into and, and look around and say it's empty because he's not here. 
And see, this is important because if this fact isn't true, then there's no reason for us to be here today. In fact, in a few months, we'll get to chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians, and Paul kind of steps back and he's like, let me remind you guys of the most important thing that I shared to you. He said, I delivered to you of first importance, Christ and him crucified, buried, and resurrected. And he goes on to explain that if, if he wasn't resurrected from the grave, he said, then all this is pointless. He says, your faith is futile and, and everything you're doing is in vain. And he says, people should feel sorry for us because there's no point to our hope. There's no point to what we're doing. But then in verse 20 of chapter 15, he says, but in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits for all who believe. See, this is, this is where we put all of it. The power of God is shown in the fact that he sent his son Jesus to take our sin and die and rise from the grave three days later. And the fact that that has happened gives us a reminder of his power, gives us a reminder of the hope that we have in him. But see, it's not just in the message itself that it has power, it's also the effects of the message See, because when we look at those who give their life to Christ and, and surrender their life to him and begin to follow, power shows up even in their life. You see it in the fact that Jesus transforms lives. People who deal with addiction and, and brokenness find healing and hope and restoration. There are stories that are changed because of God working in their life and transforming them. And you probably know some of those people who, who are a different person today because of Jesus in their life than they used to be. And I bet even if you look at your life, you're gonna see that. And it's not just the drug addict to pastor transformation stories, it's also the moments where we see God's character and nature in us that we didn't before. It's where we go from, from stress and chaos to joy and peace in Christ. It's where we go from using our words to hurt people to using our words to bless and build people up. It's where we go from holding grudges and, and being bitter towards others to living with grace and forgiveness are all ways that God's power changes our life and transforms us. You also see his power and the effects of this message and the fact that God redeems situations in our life. There are all these places that, that you can look at and, and there's these painful moments in our life, these situations that seem hopeless, it seems like there's nothing good that could come from it. Mistakes that we wish we could take back, events that we thought ruined our life, pain that we thought forever changed us and God begins to be at work redeeming and bringing something beautiful and helpful and joyful out of that. It's a way that we see God's power at work in our life. And oftentimes he brings blessings and good things as a result of that, which is kind of one of those last things that we see God's power at work in those unexpected blessings of our life. Those places where we look back and we go, man, I, I didn't even realize that in the moment, but I can see God's favor in my life, blessing me and bringing good into my life, helping me avoid things that would be destructive and answering prayers that I didn't even realize. All these are ways that we see God's power at work, both in the message and in the effects of the message. But here's what we have to do. We have to ask if how we get to God's power is something that we believe in or something that we see as foolish. Because the, the route to God's power in our life can be a little backwards from what we expect it to be. Because we don't get God's power in our life by us seeking to be powerful in ourself, but by us surrendering, by us saying that we are not powerful, by us submitting to him. We get God's power by reversing how we seek to achieve this and, and surrendering our life to him. We find power by serving others, by giving up power and seeking places of service and submission. See, all these things are a reversal because God wants to take the, the ways that we view the world and, and turn them upside down. The question is, do you believe in God's power and believe in his methodology to get that power? Are you still trying to achieve it on your own? Are you trying harder, trying to do more and be better and, and be stronger? Or are you saying, hey God, I need you and I need your help? Because when we allow ourselves to surrender and say, hey, I'm actually not powerful, then God's power starts to show up. And that message of the cross goes from foolishness to power, but it also shows up with God's message of wisdom in our life. 
See, let's look again at verse 20 uh, through 25. See, Paul says, hey, where is the one who's wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. He says, for Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. See, we're told here that the message of Christ brings power and it brings wisdom into our life. But again, we're, we're presented with a contrast and a decision to make. We're presented with this contrast of, of the wisdom of the world and the wisdom of God. And, and Paul's essentially asking the people, hey, which one are you going to follow? And, and he, he calls out these, like, these, these thought leaders, the, the wisest people. He's like, hey, where are the scribes? Where are, the, where are the, the debaters? He's saying, hey, where are the authors and inventors and lawyers and the, the smart people? And let's contrast the wisdom of God and the wisdom of men here. And he's asking us to choose between the two. And he's really pointing out that there's a couple of dangers of wisdom here. First, there's a, there's a spiritual danger that we can pursue wisdom that doesn't result in spiritual transformation. Because see, it says, hey, their wisdom, the, the Jews and the Greeks, it's saying, hey, their pursuit of wisdom didn't result in salvation. They, they tried to say, hey, let's study the, the prophecies for the Jews. Let's study the prophecies about Jesus and see if we can do that. The Greeks, it's, hey, let's find the smartest debater and, and orator and the, the person who can present these philosophical ideas the best. But he said, hey, that didn't solve their biggest problem, which is the sin and salvation need that they have. See, the, the same is true for us. We can get so caught up in just trying to be smarter and trying to understand the world and understand all these different philosophies and things better that it doesn't actually result in us finding what we're looking for, which is the solution to our sin problem. Because we can't reason our way into heaven. We can't logic our way into forgiveness of sins. We can't say, hey, here's my, here's my whiteboard with all the, the, the answers to life's problems that results in me having forgiveness. It's only in us submitting our life to Jesus and saying, hey, I'm yours. I'm looking to call you my savior and receive forgiveness for my sins. But see, even within the church, we have this temptation, this pull to, to upend wisdom and make that the most important thing. Because there's this, this temptation where we can say, hey, we're going to study the Bible. We're going to know everything. We're going to memorize it. We're going to do studies on it. We're going to sit over coffee and talk about theology and all these nuances and not have a relationship with Jesus. And that wisdom that we achieve is pointless without a relationship with Jesus. And see, even if we are in a place where we trust in Jesus as our Savior and follow him, we have to ask if our wisdom that we're achieving, our knowledge about Christ results in more obedience to him. We have to ask, hey, is, is my study of God's word, is me getting involved in doing Bible studies and seeking to grow in wisdom, does it result in me understanding how to be more obedient to God? Because nowhere in scripture does it, does it commend the people who just were really smart and knew everything about the Bible, but weren't obedient. Instead, we see that obedience is way more important than knowledge and understanding. And the storyline of scripture is filled with people who were called to do things that they didn't understand at all. But they weren't called to wisdom and understanding, they were called to walk in obedience to what God had called them to do. So is your, is your knowledge, is your understanding resulting in more obedience? Because if it's not, it's empty and it's folly. See, the second thing that we have to ask is, is what wisdom are we really trusting in? Because the second danger that Paul's wanting us to see here is that we can, we can trust in the wrong wisdom. Because the wisdom of God is very different than the wisdom of the world. And I'm not saying that the world says, hey, the sky is blue and God's wisdom says that the, the sky is red. No, it's, there's some universal truths that are shared, but the wisdom of God relates to how we navigate our life. What are the priorities that we're setting in place? What are the, the ways that we navigate situations and difficulties and decisions? 
And are we following the wisdom of the world, which is the people, it's us, it's our desires, are we following the wisdom of God? Because there's a reversal there. So when you look at the wisdom of, of the world, as he kind of brings up here, the wisdom of the world would say that a savior should come and lead a, a political and military revolution, that he should be invincible. For the Jews, they thought the Messiah would come and, and take charge politically, create an army and kind of overthrow those that were ruling in Israel. And the Greeks, they thought, well, well God should be invincible. There, there should be no one that can, can touch a God that exists. And yet, here's God's wisdom, who sends a savior to live a life of service and submission and who bleeds and dies on a cross for his people. Because God's wisdom is greater than ours. See, our wisdom today says that we're to prioritize ourselves and, and, and take care of number one first. But God's wisdom says that our life is blessed when we put other people's needs ahead of our own and seek to serve and help them. Our wisdom says that we need to worry about uh, getting as much money and wealth as we can and building that up. And God's wisdom says that if we really want to have good finances, we give away 10% of what we make right off the top and increase it from there through our tithe. The world's wisdom says that we need to, to build up a good life for ourselves here and, and build a good success story of accolades and achievements and accomplishments and possessions. But God's wisdom says that in the world, we'll see that moth and rust destroy and thieves break in and steal, but we need to lay up for ourselves treasures in heaven and build a life for ourselves in eternity instead. See, we could go on in different areas, but we see that the wisdom of God is different than the wisdom of the world. So which one are we trusting in? And really, I guess what I'm asking is, are you willing to, to fully trust and submit to the wisdom of God in your life? And I mean really submit, because I think it, it's easy for us sitting here watching, if you're watching online or listening to the podcast, it's easy to go, well, of course, I'm gonna trust and submit to the wisdom of God. And I think that's true for all of us, as long as God's wisdom aligns with our desires. But what happens when they don't align? What happens when God's wisdom is different than our desires for our life? Will we trust him in those times? What happens when God's wisdom looks foolish to us as we approach it for the first time? Are we going to trust it? Or are we gonna trust in our wisdom? Because if, if Jesus really is the Lord of our life, it means fully trusting in every piece of his wisdom and instruction in our life. And if we want to cherry pick and say, well, I'm only gonna do the stuff that makes sense to me, or I'm only gonna do the stuff that, that aligns with my, my desires and my way of seeing the world, then Jesus isn't your Lord, he's your advisor. But if Jesus is your Lord, then every piece of wisdom that he delivers to us becomes our wisdom and instruction and in how we are going to navigate our life forward. So today, is Jesus your Lord or is he your advisor? And really what Paul is seeking to build as a foundation for the church in Corinth, but for us here today is, are you going to pursue God's power and wisdom in your life? Or are you gonna keep trying to do it on your own? Because it, it seems foolish to say that, that we get power by admitting weakness, but that's exactly how it works in God's formula. It seems crazy to say that, that we find wisdom by admitting what we don't know and by submitting to other people's instruction, but that's exactly how it works in God's formula. It's a great reversal that takes place by saying, God, I, I really am weak to accomplish the meaningful things in this life, but I know that you're powerful and you can work so I'm gonna to submit to you. It really is how it works to say, God, I don't have all the answers. I can't solve all of my problems. I don't have a perfect solution to all the things I'm facing, but I know you do, so I'm gonna try and follow you the best I can. And see, when we're willing to step into that place of surrender and submission to him, we see his power and wisdom show up in our life. And as Paul closes with here, it gives us reason to boast, not in what we can do, but to boast in the Lord. And that's our hope and prayer for you as our church here, but as individuals seeking to follow and see God's power and wisdom show up in our life. So I pray that today you would experience that great reversal, that you would surrender to Christ and see him work in your life. Let's pray. 
God, we thank you that, that we can be in a place where we can study your word and that here 2,000 years later, the, the book to the church in Corinth is meaningful and helpful for us, helping us navigate issues, helping us understand what it means to walk in faith and obedience to you. And God, we are a people full of pride who, who think that we can do it on our own, that we have the answers, that we have the solutions. So God, I pray that you would help us to, to, instead of living in pride and arrogance, that we would live in submission and humility, knowing that you are the God of the universe, the one who created us, the one who saved us. God, you're the one that loves us. You want to give us good gifts. You want to bless and work in our life. So help us to get out of the way. Help us to, to trust in your power when we don't think there's a way for things to happen. Help us to trust in your wisdom when we're trying to understand how the world and our life works. God, we want you to be the ultimate authority, but our sin gets in the way. So God, help us to surrender, to trust in you in every area. In Jesus' name, amen. The Bible may seem foolish to non-believers, but to followers of Jesus, the message is powerful. And like Robert said, the way we find power in God's word isn't by being powerful, but by acknowledging our weakness. If today's message spoke to you and you'd like to support the ministry of Calvary, you can do so by visiting our website, calvaryaz.com. The homepage has links to contact us, to give, listen to past sermons, and subscribe to the Word for the Day daily devotionals. That's it for today. I hope you'll join us again next week. Bye-bye.